Amen. Thank you, Ben. And good morning and welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church here in Kirksville. We are grateful once again to be gathered in this online way. My name is Reverend Jennifer Finley, our Momentum and Discipleship Pastor. And it is a good and joyful thing to gather together for worship this morning. Good morning, everyone. We're so glad you're joining us today, whether it's this morning right at 945 or later on during the day or even later in the week. I'm Reverend Lori Landon, Administration and Care Pastor here at First UMC, and we're so glad you're with us today. And as we begin worship, um, as we prepare our hearts and our minds and our spaces, we have a couple of announcements. Um, those of you who are part of our community should be receiving a mailing this week, reminding us that given our current conditions, we are going to be online only for September 13th and September 20th. And while we look forward to the time when we can gather in person, we also know that there is joy in gathering this way. You'll also be receiving a brochure in the mail that has all kinds of other ways. Um, worship and beyond to connect with each other and with the church and with God throughout this fall season. And so we invite you to look for that in the mail. Um, and if you aren't on our mailing list, drop us a message or an email and let us know and we can make sure that we get that to you as well. And now, as we truly do prepare our spaces and our hearts for worship, as we do each week, we invite you to find a source of light Whatever that might be, a candle, or a flashlight, or even a cell phone, if you're not watching on your phone. And we invite you to remember that the light of Christ is with us, that the Holy Spirit is with us as we worship together. We also invite you um, to make sure that if you want to participate in Holy Communion with us, that you have... Communion elements, whatever they may be with you, um, bread and juice, whatever they may be. And for today, if you are worshiping at home and you have a salt shaker, a simple salt shaker uh, with you around the house, we invite you to find that. That'll be a part of our worship experience at the end of the message and after communion. And now, as we have prepared our spaces, we center and we join in this call to worship together that you can find in your online bulletin. Today, we worship. We step, step into, into this, this new day, day listening, listening together, together to, to God's, God's great story. story. Together, we worship and pray. Holy, Holy God, God, we move, move into, into this time and space with, with our sight and sense of smell, with, with our, our listening and, and our touch, with our hearts and our minds, so that we may live inside your stories. Help us remember who we are as your children, as we celebrate the purpose you give us as your people. Amen. We're joined together in the hymn 140, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Great is God's faithfulness, and that is what we affirm together as we are gathered in worship this morning, and that is what we do as we join our voices across time and space to use this affirmation of faith many of you may know by heart. Let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And amen. As we said those words, I imagined I could hear all of your voices ringing out around us, for that is the beauty of the saints coming together. That is the beauty of what we do in worship. And we do that as we come into this prayer time as well bringing all of our joys, all of our triumphs, all of the things we want to celebrate, and lifting those to God. We invite you, as these candles are lit, to lift those out loud to God, whether there are other folks with you who can hear you, or whether that is simply a giving thanks to God. We also know that there are many things that are challenging, many things that we cry out to God asking for help. And so as these candles are lit, know that those prayers are rising to God as well. And again, we invite you to say those out loud, to acknowledge the challenge and the good. And as we pray together this morning, know that you are truly not alone. Let us pray. Let us pray this morning to our God, saying, Lord, in your righteousness, deliver us and set us free. Mighty God, you have done great things. Who is like you? You alone are our rock of refuge, our strong fortress. You alone are our hope, and in you, you alone is our trust. Lord, in your righteousness, deliver us and set us free. Merciful God, your love never ends. Do not be far from us. Strengthen us that we might be givers of your grace and forgiveness. Send your Holy Spirit to empower our hands to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, and love all as you have first loved us. Lord, in your righteousness, deliver us and set us free. Loving God, be with all those who labor in service of others. Give them hearts of courage and fill them with your peace. Hear the cries of those who are in bondage and oppressed. Whatever forms injustice takes, open our eyes to pray and work for release. Lord, in your righteousness, deliver us and set us free. Abundant God, be with those who long for your restoration and healing. Today, we ask your blessing upon those we know who need that healing touch in body, mind, and spirit. We also lift up to you those who we bring before you now with our lips or within our hearts. Lord, in your righteousness, deliver us and set us free. Faithful God, your power and your righteousness are without limits. Hear us, your servants, as we follow you to the day when faith Hope and love will be upon the lips of all of us, your children. And hear us as we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And we thank Elizabeth Anderson, who is leading our songs today for us. And please join me at home as we sing hymn 128, He Leadeth Me. Amen. This morning we are hearing the word of God from the book of Exodus, chapter 12. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. And whenever your children ask you, what do you mean by this observance? You shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, for he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed down and worshiped. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Well, we've skipped ahead a little bit in the story of Moses that we've been telling these past two weeks. We had heard from Scott and Jennifer these past couple weeks how Moses was born into a Hebrew family in a time of genocide. He was saved through the actions of several different women. 
the midwives Shipra and Pua playing their part, his mother Yochaved, his sister Miriam, and the daughter of the Pharaoh. Moses had been raised as an Egyptian prince, but by the time he encountered God's presence beyond the wilderness in a burning bush, he had become an outlaw, an exile, a shepherd, a foreigner in a strange land. And so maybe it's not that much of a surprise that in response to God's call to return to Egypt, to confront the Pharaoh and lead the Hebrew people out of slavery, his response was full of questions and confusion. They won't believe me or listen to me, he responded. God assured him that they would. And he led Moses through a series of dramatic signs that he would use to prove that his mission was from God. But Moses was still unsure. And he protested that he was slow of speech and slow of tongue. Surely making convincing speeches to leaders of nations was not in his comfort zone. Telling the sheep where to go may have been more his speed at that point in time. Surely he was not the right person for the job. Well, I wondered as I was reading this, how many of us have felt that at some point in time? I am not the right person for this job. Surely there's someone else that you can call instead, God. Someone who can do the things this requires better. And maybe if you've been through that, maybe you discovered what Moses did. That it is more about what God does through people. Usually ordinary, everyday people like you and me. Than about our skills or lack of skills. Moses is given a companion for his task. His older brother by birth, Aaron. And when they return and tell the Hebrew people of God's promises, they see the dramatic signs and they are filled with hope. But then Moses and Aaron go to speak with the Pharaoh. And they ask that the Hebrew people be given time off to go pray to their God. Well, the response is more than just a simple no. The Pharaoh makes things worse. The people are no longer given straw, but they're held to the same daily quota of bricks. And their spirits in the process of these worsening conditions are crushed. God has promised to rescue them from their bondage, to redeem them from their heavy burdens in Egypt. And yet, it seems like Moses by following God's directions has only made things go from bad to worse. And things kept getting worse. It was indeed a time of broken spirits. Indeed, we are told that the Israelites could not hear God's promises, God's good news, even when Moses reminded them. Because of their broken spirits. In Hebrew, this literally is shortness of breath. They could not catch their breath. And then came what we know as the plagues. Now, many of us know this story if we grew up in Sunday school, in children's Sunday school, where we talked about flies and grasshoppers and frogs, and perhaps we made some paper mache frogs or hopped them down the Sunday school aisles. At least I did. And that's appropriate. But as adults, we may miss that this was a time of true broken spirits for all living things. The land suffered and could not produce or support life as usual, could not provide water or food for the people. Livestock suffered and died. People suffered. Sustaining life and hope was hard work. It was not an easy time. All that the people knew and could see, it seemed, was failing around them. 
And that was true for both the Egyptians and the Hebrews. Everyone was in this at the same time. Making sense of the world was hard. Perhaps, perhaps we can relate in some ways. It was a time of impending grief, a grief that all of creation would feel. This story of liberation is a harsh and bloody one. The oppression of the Hebrew people by the Pharaoh was rooted in fear. It was violent. Remember, this was the man who had ordered the killing of all their baby boys at the time that Moses had been born. The plagues announced by Moses and Aaron answered that violence with acts that were violent in and of themselves harsh consequences. But the Pharaoh was hard of heart and did not let the people go. And so God gave Moses and Aaron instructions to announce a final plague. Each firstborn son of Egypt this time would die. And as we reach Exodus chapter 12, we hear that the Hebrew people were given instructions on how to prepare for this plague because what was about to happen would become their defining story with God. It would shape forever who they were and what God had done for them and for their descendants from generation to generation. This would be a new beginning for them, one that they were to remember forever. And so Exodus 12 tells that each household was to prepare a lamb for sacrifice so that all could eat of it. Small households were to partner together, sharing so that no one would be left out with no excess meat left over. And when that night came, each house was instructed to mark their door frames with some of the blood, a sign of those who were trusting in God for their deliverance so that death would pass them over. They were instructed to roast that lamb and eat it with quick flat bread and bitter herbs, already dressed and ready for travel. No leftovers were to be taken along. Anything remaining as dawn approached, they were to burn before they left. This would be the final letting go of their time in Egypt. The 400 some years that their people had spent there were about to end and they needed to prepare to fully leave it behind. Because releasing something can be hard, even if it is a situation that has brought pain and suffering, it's what we know. And it's hard to walk into an unknown future, even if that comes with promises that are beautiful and freeing. And so in great love, God gave the people a way to release what would keep them from walking forward in God's liberation and freedom, the experience of Passover would become a way to remember what God had done. And so we come back to where we started in this story with these words. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. And when your children ask you, what do you mean by this? You shall say, it is the Passover of the Lord, for he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed down and worshiped. This shall be a day of remembrance. The instructions were when you do these things, remember. Remember God's presence in the midst. Remember God's power. Remember God's promises. Remember God's faithfulness. And they did. 
This became a framework for how they worshipped, a yearly observance, a remembrance in the good times and in the hard times. It was a part of their wilderness wanderings and generations later as they crossed into the promised land and all of the years in between. It's a practice of recalling and remembering and retelling the story of God's faithfulness. And to this day, it is, of course, a part of Jewish practice. And it is a part of our family story as Christians, this letting go and this remembering. Well, growing up in Jewish families, Jesus and the first disciples would have observed this remembrance every year. It's a lovely thought, isn't it, to think of Jesus and Peter and James and John and the other disciples taking their turn as the youngest child, asking the question, why is this night different from other nights? What does this observance mean? Because the story of the exodus from Egypt, of God hearing the cries of the people in slavery and bringing them out to deliver them in great faithfulness, this was the story of their people. And when they wound up in Jerusalem the week before Jesus died, as they gathered in the upper room around that table. It was the observance of the Passover ritual that brought them together before his death on the cross. And as they gathered around the table with bread and wine, Jesus gave new meaning to familiar symbols. God had delivered his people from bondage before. And God was about to do this again in a new way, to expand that liberation and freedom to all through Jesus. And so we once again find ourselves at this table, this invitation into God's grace, this invitation into the mystery of Christ's presence with us across time and space. The sacrament that is this tangible reminder of the way that God has come to us. And it's in this time that we acknowledge our humanness. And so each week we pray a prayer of confession together. So we invite you as you find these words in your online bulletin to pray together. Holy God, we, we confess, confess today our humanness, humanness letting, letting go of what has been and embracing what can be is hard. There are times we believe we are traveling this journey alone. Forgive us the times we forget you are with us. Forgive us the times we forget others are beside us. Help us embrace your love for ourselves and all of your creation. Friends, church, hear this good news. God is with us offering forgiveness and hope and a way when it seems like there is no way. Let us live together in God's free and liberating presence. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Amen. And as God's forgiven and liberated people, we share this peace of Christ with each other. This has become part of my favorite part of worship each week. And so we truly invite you in the comments, wherever you are saying it out loud, the peace of Christ be with you. May the love and peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Love and peace of Christ with you and the love and peace of Christ be with all of you today. God's deliverance was unfolding again as the blood of Jesus Christ was shed on the cross. The power of sin and death was being broken. It would no longer keep God's beloved people in bondage because the saving freedom of the resurrection was open and available for all. And when he spoke at the table that night, Jesus spoke not only to those who were physically gathered with him, but he spoke to those in every time and in every place who would be his followers as they gathered with the bread and the fruit of the vine 
And he gave them a new meaning for those symbols. This is my body given in love for you. This is the cup of the new covenant of forgiveness. And again, he gave a ritual of remembrance. He said, each time you do this, remember me. Remember God's faithfulness and what God has done. And today, as we do each week, we lift our individual pieces of bread, whatever you have, lifting them together, trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit to make the many one. And so too with the cup, we lift our individual cups, trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit, making the many one today. Let us pray. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on all who are gathered around the bread and the cup in different places and times at the table of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and cup that through them we may know the presence of the living Christ. Be renewed as the body of Christ for the world. Make us one with Christ and one with each other in a bond which is not limited by place nor time, but is woven together through God's love in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now, now the table is set and blessed and we feast. So we invite you to take your bread. Christ's body broken for us that the many may become one. And the cup of love is poured out for you and for all so that the world may be transformed by God's love. Take and drink. I pray that in that moment you can taste and sense and smell God's love and God's presence. And as an act of thanksgiving, we pray together. Eternal God, we give, we give you, you thanks, thanks for this, this holy, holy mystery, mystery in which, which you have, have given, given yourself, yourself to us, one, one body gathered, gathered in you. Grant that we may go into our days in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the, in the name, name of, of Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. And we'll continue celebrating the newness through God with hymn 383. This is a day of new beginnings. This is a day of new beginnings. Time to Jesus, God's mighty spirit now as then can make for us a world of difference as faith and hope are born again. Then let us with the spirit's daring get from the past and leave behind our disappointment, guilt and grieving. Seeking new paths and sure to find. Christ is alive and goes before us to show and share what love can do. This is a day of new beginnings. Our God is making all things new. Our God is making all things new as we affirm that truth together this morning and as we prepare to leave this place. 
we invite you into a simple practice. If you have salt with you, you may want to do this now or simply to make this a practice throughout the week. A simple, easy, ordinary practice with ordinary salt. I invite you to hold that salt in your hand, to feel the distinct grains between your fingers, and practice remembering. Remembering God's faithfulness, but also perhaps acknowledging and remembering the tears of grief, whatever they are, those salty tears. And then practice turning your hand and releasing that salt. Practice that remembering and that letting go, knowing that God is in both the remembering and in the releasing. And then opening your palms upward to God, prepared to embrace whatever God may have in these coming days. And as you go into the days ahead, the weeks ahead, the years ahead, may you remember God's great faithfulness and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and power and strength and encouragement of the Holy Spirit fill you when you need it most. Go in peace, my friends. <laughs>